there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. Today we're going to take a look at everything you ever wanted to know about the basics of diesel electric locomotives. This is a Cooper's Marne SW9 switching locomotive and today we're going to learn all about what makes it go. So come on aboard today and we're going to learn about trains. I'm Chris Bowden with the Geek Group. Welcome to Coopersville, which is home of the Coopersville and Marne Railway and Bruce Quinn. Hi, sir. Hello, Chris. Good to meet you. And you. We get to play with trains. We get to work with trains. Hard work. Totally. Yes. So, such a hard, hard, manly work. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> now this is my hometown where I grew up. And when I was a kid, one of the first jobs I got to do was being a volunteer down here on the Coopersville and Marne Railway. And it's still here after all these years. You guys have been around for a while now. Since 1989. Wow. So 21 years. That's awesome. And we're going to get to look at these toys and teach people the basics of how diesel electric locomotives work. That's the idea. Okay. Um, so this is a good one for that. It's got all the standard stuff with you know the big prime mover and the compressors and generators and journal boxes and traction motors and all that fun stuff. And it's not too complicated because it was built in 1952. Things were a little simpler then. Yeah, it's not all electronic. The modern ones aren't nearly as much fun. No, right. So, <laughs> well, let's start and show people how things work. Um, here, we'll open the first set of doors. Now, all right, Bruce, come here and tell me what we got. What that you're looks looking like at? an air compressor. That is an air compressor, and that is what builds up the pressure to give us, among other things, the air we need to stop the train. Okay. Yeah, now the the Everything pretty much on the train at this vintage is either electric or pneumatic. Well, so everything is controlled by air. Yeah the, yeah, the brakes, the horn, the bell, the sand. Right. Everything. Yeah. Even the windshield wipers. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got, this looks to be a three-cylinder, very serious air compressor up front that's driven directly off the, the diesel. Right. And then forward of here, there's a big fan up in this room. Yep. And I don't know if we can get enough light to see down in there, but we'll give it a shot. Here, we'll open this access hatch and see if we can stick a camera in there. It's dark, it's scary, but there is a big giant fan right up front. That's the, the forward radiator. And that's where the, the engine breathes. So we've got that. And that's, that's behind door number one. Now what is that? There's a tube up there. I have no idea what that pipe does. Bruce, any idea? There's a pair, there's a big pipe that goes out to a Y and they go up. Now why is that? I have no idea. I'm gonna look around front and see if I can figure it out. Because I never noticed that before. It looks like some sort of an exhaust, but I'm not sure. Well, the only thing that is anywhere near up here. Oh, I know what it is. Oh yeah. It's the water feed for the radiators right. up on top. Yeah, because there's your radiator yep. right up there. And this is the air flow through the radiators up there. Right. There's actually a pair of radiators up on top of the locomotive, right under the nose, right, right up here. So that's door number one. Now we'll close this and head on down to the next one. Okay, now that is a big oil filter. Now we were trying to figure this out before and we couldn't quite figure out for sure what this actually is for. Do we have any ideas now? Same as before. Same as before, it's a big oil filter and we don't really know what from there. Right. Okay, uh, <laughs> so here's some of the drive system for the compressor back here and big oil filter, lots of plumbing and the next section is where we get into fuel. So that's where things tend to get more interesting. So let's head on over that way. All right. Now we've got, that looks like a turbine. That's, that, is, that a, is this turbocharged? No. Okay. No, I don't know what that is, but no, it it's not a turbine. It looks like a turbo of some sort, or maybe just a pump. Um, it could be a really big coolant pump. Uh, that's probably closer to the truth. Okay, that would make that the filter 
and a reservoir for the engine coolant, which would make a lot of sense. Right. Okay, so we figured that out. Yep. Now, you were teaching us about these before, the, uh, the fuel filters. Yeah, two, two fuel filters. This is our primary one here, and if you look up in the sight glass, you can see that it is full of fuel. When this one gets plugged, then this one takes over, and if that starts filling up with fuel, then we've got to get them both changed immediately. Okay. So that, that's, that's your warning is, right. you know, time to fix it. Right. Okay. Um, any idea what this is down here? Uh, something with brass uh, It's very things. pretty. Yes, right. It's very, very nice. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. It involves something that's very wet. Beyond that, I have no idea, but it's really cool looking. All right. Now we're going to get into the prime mover. This is only one section of the 1,200 horsepower diesel. Okay. Engine. Yeah. This is a. It's 1,200 horsepower. Right. It's uh, 12 cylinders. Right. Diesel, and we've got the blow-off cocks here. They are our air test cocks. Okay. Air test cocks. Right. Okay. And this is for valve gear. Access to our valves. And then this is access down to the crankcase. Right. But this is the engine. That is the engine. The okay. diesel engine. Now there was. There's a system for these. These are important. Can, can you teach right. us about these? Well, when we have to start this locomotive from scratch, what we have to do is go around and back off on these a prescribed number of turns. So it's, it's a valve at the top of the cylinder head that you open. Right. Okay. And see what happens when an engine sits for any length of time, condensation can build up in there. And when that happens, of course, water, and water does not compress very well, and so we have to get that water out of the cylinders. Because otherwise it, it try to displace and crack and right. break something. Right. Okay. So by backing these off a prescribed number of turns, once we've done that, then on the other side, what we have to do is what we call barring over the engine, <laughs> which is not a fun thing to do. That's, that's the big lever of doom. That is, yes, <laughs> right. Um, we do that six times. Six pushes or six full well, revolutions? Well, six pushes. Okay. Yeah, and that's quite enough for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once that's done, then we can go ahead and tighten these, just hand tight. Okay. And then we're set to start it up. Six pushes has to equal just about one revolution of the entire engine. Um, it's got to be just about, because from, from about here to there, it's about, yeah. Yeah, a little over okay. one revolution. So to open these, though, you just grab and turn, and that backs it off for that. And that just does that cylinder. So right. you have to do this 12 times all right. the way around the engine. Okay. Yeah. And they have to be all done at one time. You can't just do one, go over and bar it over. You have to yeah, do all Yeah, yeah, you have to have them all right. open or it right. would defeat the purpose. Yep. More of the same. More of the same, same stuff. But we have the engine plate here, which tells us that this is model number 12567B. It was made by General Motors, the Electromotive Division in LaGrange, Illinois. Um, its serial number for this engine, uh, not the entire locomotive, just the engine, is 52E107, and it was built on April 25th, 1957, which means that this engine, the, the actual prime mover, the diesel engine, was replaced. It's not original to the locomotive. They can actually swap it out. It's a really epic job to do, but they do it all the time. It's, it's cool to see. So you guys are used to slinging around big metal. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why we have these things on the hood of the engine. Yep, that's to, to lift the hood off. Right. Also makes a handy tie-down point. And a handy place to hang on. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the back of the engine, more of the same. We've, we've got two behind each door. So it's it's an engine that, here, we'll, we'll take a step back and we'll show people just how long the actual engine is. You stand here and I'll, I'll go to the other end, which should be this door. Yep, here's, here's the other end of the engine, is all the way back to here. So between you and me is just the actual 1,200 horsepower diesel engine. One big engine. And the cool thing is, this, this is where we get into neat stuff, all that horsepower and there's no transmission. There, there is no mechanical gearing system or a gearbox or anything like that. On the front, it's directly coupled to an air compressor, which handles all the little stuff. 
And on the back, it's connected to this giant thing. That is a generator. And right here is the flywheel with the cover missing. It's laying down there. But this is the flywheel right here. And you can see there's actually timing degree marks on there, which is pretty cool. And those are the holes where they stick the bar in on the other side of the engine to bar it over. And we'll show that in a second. But this is the actual generator that where 90% of the energy goes is into that generator. So that's, that's the main purpose. Now we open the double doors. I'm going to step through here. That's a lot of generator. Now what can you teach us here? Well, your diesel engine, this is actually called a diesel electric. Mm -hmm. So you've got your diesel engine that you just saw. That turns over the generator, which generates the electricity, which goes down to the traction motors to run the wheels. And this is what actually makes everything move. This is the closest to a transmission. Uh, a generator is a transducer, which means it changes one form of energy into another. This changes mechanical energy from the diesel engine up front into electrical energy, which goes to the traction motors down below. Um, I'm wondering, can we open this? Uh, carefully. Okay. This should give us access to the brushes. Yeah, just uh, remember what it says there, just in case. Yeah, dog will bite you. Um, I can't get the back off, so I'm not going to fight it. Is there an easy way to pop that on the back? Or? It should. Well, it no, should wiggle off, but I don't want to mess with it. I don't no, want to make it angry. No. All right. We will see if we can get some close-up shots in there later. We'll try for that. But this is the generator where all the power gets moved down below. So I guess we should head down below and show them where it goes. OK, so now this is where the power goes to is down here. This great big thing up in here, if we can wedge our cameraman up in there, this big box is a traction motor. And what this is, is a gigantic DC electric motor that feeds power through a, a short gear system directly to the axle on these wheels. Now there's one traction motor for every axle. An axle on a locomotive is two wheels and the bar that connects them together. So this traction motor feeds this axle. And if you go back over here, here's another traction motor right there. And that feeds power to this axle. Now, the assembly with the two axles and the suspension system, and yes, there's a suspension system under a locomotive. You can see there's big springs in here, and there's big springs here, and all of this actually flexes going down the track. This assembly here with the brakes and the axles and all that is called a truck. So this is one truck. The two together are a set of trucks, and they're not actually physically connected to the locomotive, which is really cool. If you pick up the locomotive, if you came in with a, a giant crane or something and pick the locomotive up, the trucks will stay sitting on the tracks. There's only a, a really big steel pin that goes right through and it just sits on top and gravity holds everything together. So teach us about this because this is a neat bit of history here. This is what they call a journal box and inside there is the end of one of the axles and if you look down in there you can see all kinds of messy stuff and wadding back there. That's used to lubricate this axle. One of the key parts of uh, keeping this thing going properly is what we call a journal brass. And if you look in here, you can see the brass up there, but that's, then also that's a, this part. Right. And then you see the gray, which is a lead lining. And to help you understand it a little bit better, I just happen to have. One right here. Oh, that's convenient. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> here, you want me to hold that and you can yeah, point things fine. out? All right. Now, again, you've got the uh, the journal, the brass here. Then you can see the lead if you turn it around the other way. You kind of get a better look at the lining of the lead. Now, the lead is a billet, and that acts as a lubricant because lead is very soft, and the brass gives it the strength, and the, the idea is the brass gives it a smooth surface, and it's very strong, and it allows heat to wick away but the, the lead itself is a lubricating layer. So the, the whole thing, now is this a bottom or a top? It looks different from that one. I didn't know if this, is this just like a different it's, model or? This is off a different locomotive. That's okay. actually off a steam locomotive. Oh wow. I have some other <laughs> ones that come off of freight cars, which are a different size yet. Okay. So yes, there are different 
brasses, depending upon the axle size. Now, there's a problem with these, uh, historically. Well, yeah. Um, it's what we used to call a hot box uh, when we had cabooses on the trains. The crew would be sitting up in the cupola on the caboose, and they're watching each side of the train, and sometimes they would see smoke coming from somewhere up ahead. What that usually meant was this had dried out and it overheated and started a fire in there. And so what they had to do is stop the train. They had a, a hook that they would reach in there and pull that wadding that was burning out and just ex extinguish the fire and then repack it, add oil, and usually they were good to go again. Okay, but this isn't allowed on railroads anymore. No, friction bearings, which is what this is called, a friction okay. bearing. Uh, you are not allowed to take these on the Class 1 North American rail system. Okay. What they use these days are roller bearings. Like Timken. Right. Yeah. I, I remember um, uh, commercials in my dad's old railroad magazines right. where the, it was the, the Timken commercials and they'd have like office receptionists pushing a boxcar. Right. They, yeah. They'd have all the girls come out and push a boxcar because the Timken bearings were so smooth that, you know, girls can push it. And it, right. was, it was a whole thing back in the 50s. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, if you want to get your crew and try to push this engine, you're welcome we'll to. We'll give it a shot. We'll yeah. get right on yeah, that. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Though, with modern day roller bearing stuff, like, I would assume you guys have some roller bearing rolling stock. I've seen, like, the, the CSX uh, cars down on the end. Yeah, uh, we don't have a lot, but there's a, there are a couple of them. With but them. in theory, it should be doable to take that, that big 40-foot box car, blow the air off, and a, a couple of our staff could push it easy. In theory. In theory, provided yeah. zero grade and the wind is right and the phase could, of the moon is just right. I could tell you some stories, but uh, since it's <laughs> being recorded... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's for the DVD edition. Yeah, I yeah. Yeah. So what else should we know about this? Well, the other thing you need to know about this is you want to keep your fingers yeah. away. Very big spring. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to put this in my pocket and we'll forget it ever happened. Ah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll set this up here for now. You realize you got your fingerprints on what I polished last night. <laughs> well, that's convenient. Yeah, right. While we're up front, we got to talk about the F. We you gotta mean, talk about the F. You mean that? Yes, yes, the sacred F. Well, the F, you want me to? Yeah, tell it, you, okay. you tell it. All right. <laughs> it used to be that I thought F meant fine. So when I was in school, I tried my best to get all the Fs I could. It wasn't until I got to college I found out that F was not for fine. But that's not what this, the engine is fine, but actually the F means front. I find that hilarious. It is, especially on a locomotive like this. <laughs> but the reason this happened is back in the transition days when they went from steam to diesel, they sometimes could not tell the difference between the front and then the rear of a, a diesel engine. Whereas on a steam locomotive... It's pretty could. obvious, yeah. Yeah, except in a couple of cases, but yeah. yeah. So the government said engines have got to have an F marking the front. Now, in fairness to railroaders, you don't have an R there. Once we know where the front is, we can figure <laughs> out where the rear is. Now, this law is still in effect today because when we repainted one of our engines about three years ago, we didn't have that on there, and the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, came out and said, you gotta put the F on there. So it's, it's a thing, it's still a thing. It is still a thing. Now, can I tell them about pulling pockets? Okay, this, this is neat. All right, now up front, just around the corner from the F, we have this. Now, this is just, it's just a little bit of metal welded in here, and you, normally you wouldn't think too much of it, but there's a really cool bit of history here. This is called a polling pocket. Now, by the 50s, when they made this engine, these pretty much weren't used at all anymore, but, and, and with good reason, they're stupid dangerous. But it's, it's still here, and they, they still put these on some locomotives today. Back a billion years ago, when men were manly men, in order to move rolling stock on different rails and sometimes further out in front of the locomotive when you didn't want to couple to it, they would use poles. They'd take big pieces of like oak fence post with metal ends on it. They'd, they'd put a metal cap on the end and you'd stick one in here and then you could have a car on the track next to the locomotive out ahead of it and you line everything up and you pray really hard that he comes in slow and it catches and then boom! And now you're pushing on the car on the sidetrack. This is fantastically dangerous. 
The number of ways you can kill yourself doing this are just astounding and it would never fly in the modern world. But that's what they used to do and you can bet a lot of guys died doing things like that. But thankfully, like the Lincoln pin coupler, it's something that's long since gone. Okay, Bruce, now we get down in here. We've talked about axles and that. Now this big thing here is the actual brake shoe. Right. And this is the brake lever, which goes up. It, there, there's a linkage down. It actually goes below, I think. This is the fixed point and it levers like this and then it goes down below, twists, and that's the, the brake cylinder there? Right. Okay, tell people about that a second. Okay, it's, it's really kind of a, like a big erector set, but when the, uh, the air is applied on here, this cylinder, as we'll show you later, will travel, and that moves the linkage down through here, which compresses the brake shoes against all of the wheels. Now this is the fulcrum, this is actually bolted through right here, and this doesn't move. This piece here twists like that. Right. So there's a massive amount of force there because that lever's really long. So that's that's got to push that all the way out. Well, and you've got it there and you've got it up here. Yeah, it goes both ways. Right. And then it moves this bar down here, which slides, and you can see where it, it's moved in the past. It's a very dirty machine. Very, <laughs> very dirty machine. And moves that there. And then back here, this is the attachment point through here. And then this squeezes in and just simple friction this pushes against the side and and there's enough energy there to stop a locomotive right now if it takes 1200 horsepower to make it move it takes just as much energy to make it stop and all that gets turned into heat right here it does get hot yep now to do that you've got a really big air reservoir back here that's right. that's these now there's one on the other side as well is correct yep. okay and then tucked in between them We've got that, which is the fuel tank. That holds, what, about five, 600 gallons, I think? Uh, 550 gallons, I believe it 550? is. 550, okay. So that's our air tank. Here is where you put the fuel in it. Here's the gas cap. And you can see, there's a valve right here, and they just put a big hose on and fill it up, just like a car. Now, what else do we have that's interesting down here that you wanna teach people about before we head on up? I don't believe there's anything. It's pretty, it's the same thing as the front. It's another set of trucks. Right. Okay. okay oh, sure. and there's a light here. Very important, you have to have a light. Yes. <laughs> now, while we're on the ground, let's talk about couplers. This is an AAR coupler, and it's it's the modern day version of the, the Janny, or is it Jenny? The I don't know if it's the Janny coupler or the Jenny coupler. The guy who invented it, I don't remember. Uh, Some guy. We'll put a link to it. We'll put a link right here on Wikipedia and you can check that link and learn the history of the coupler because I don't remember it all. Now the way this works is it's it's a right hand coupler and with Bruce's help we can show how they work. And all right, we'll take this lever. No, no, I need your hand a second. I was going to do that first. I was going to do the hand oh, thing. What do you do for a kid? You know, you just show the hand. Right, yeah. Okay, here's how couplers work. They're actually two right hands that hook together. That's why all couplers, anywhere you look, always look like a right hand. It's not a right and a left, because if you had a right and a left, they wouldn't line up. So all couplers on both ends of every piece of rolling stock in America are exactly the same. So that when you've got them both out like this and they look the same, when they're facing each other, they come in and they grab. And just like a hand, you can see right here, there's the thumb out the side here, and then the hand that grabs. And there's a big pin to open it up. Here, you pull the lever and I'll be the car. And that opens right up like that. Now, when the train comes in, now it's opened, it'll hit right here and it pushes this. And I don't know if I can push it on my own. Yeah, it's not gonna work. So we'll lift that up. And when the train comes in, it pushes and the pin drops in place. Now you don't have to hold this up to bring them together. It'll do that on its own. But that's the mechanical connection. And this will actually handle so much force that you could probably pick the locomotive up from that. It's, it's a massive amount of energy that one of these will withstand. That is true, although I would not. I wouldn't want to try it. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that covers the coupler. Now the other important part up here is the brake line, which is this, which is a big rubber hose comes off the front and they always come down on the same side because while the couplers are all right-handed, brake lines are all left-handed. And you can see it makes the, the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip happen in there. Now, in a minute, we'll actually take the train and we'll back it up to another car and we'll couple on to show you the whole system that goes together. But it basically works with, this connects on its own, 
and then there's a signaling process and you have a, a brakeman come in and connect that on and it's a very dangerous job and then they open the air valve and that'll apply air into the next car and you can control the brakes with that and then everybody moves on happily so thankfully to do this we have a very brave brakeman this is Jim who's hardcore we're happy to have you sir now you're a real life brakeman yeah okay so you, you in a second we'll move the train and you can couple a car on for us okay okay if, if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing it seems to be what you do okay cool all right well what's next do you want to head up inside Oh, that's a good place to go, I guess. Well, okay, Bruce, now back here is the battery box. Now, I notice your new batteries are a lot smaller than the originals. They are smaller, but apparently, from what we understand, they have a lot better cold cranking power than oh, the other okay. ones. Oh, okay. Well, that's pretty cool. And these go all the way across under both sides. Right. The back. I, I like the back porch. It's nice. Not, yep. not a lot of locomotives have that. So, no, and it's not a safe place to ride, either. Really? How come? Well, if we were coming up to a railroad crossing and uh, somebody doesn't pay attention to the train and we happen to hit them, and if somebody's out here, there are no seat belts. And there's no safe place to be when the car flips up over either, so that would be right. bad. Okay. Yep. Cool. Well, let's take a look inside the cab. Now, we've got the basement, which is kind of neat. Can, can we open this and have a look? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for what comes up? Oh, it should be interesting. It's a very nice new door you've got there. Yeah, isn't that's, it though? That's modern. Now, what is this? What, what do we... Hey! Hey, 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 hey. That looks like something from my world. Just don't touch it. Yeah, that, that dog will bite you. Now, this looks an awful lot like a, a big switch. I'm guessing this is the power for the traction motors, either master on and off or taking us into or out of transition. Sounds good. <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> I just run the thing. Okay. Um, well, that is a gargantuan DC switch. And from the looks of it, I'm guessing it's two pole. And that is, I've never seen a switch that big in my life. That's amazing. So that is probably either on or off for the motors. Or this is the switch that takes us into and out of transition because the, the transition is when we go from having the motors connected in series to having the motors connected in parallel. Um, and they don't label the switch in here that way, so I honestly don't know if you start in series or start in parallel. My guess is they would start in series and then transition over to parallel, and that would certainly be the kind of switch that I'd want to do that with. And you can see the, the size of the wire here is just phenomenal. This is massive stuff. There's a set of big resistors down there. Those are pretty cool. And I'm going to be really careful because i got medley things on my belt. Look over here. We've got some more very serious contactors, but nothing as big as that big transition one. Um, there's a big blower right here. And a lot of creepy scary down under there. There's also the there's a tube for the chain from the handbrake right there. So hand me the camera and I'll give people a look right down in here. This is what you see down in the scary. Here's... There's the blower, and you can see over here, that right there is the tube for the chain. You can see the chain going out the bottom there. And it's, it's a lot of dark and a lot of scary, and we'll give you a good close-up look at that switch. Check that out. That is a massive switch. I want one of those. If you are a collector or an old railroad electrician out there in the world who happens to have one of these laying in their garage, please give us a call. Now back here, we've got the resistor bank, which is kind of cool. And then just lots of plumbing, lots of stuff. So that's pretty nifty. Here, we'll hand the camera back to Corey. Thank you, sir. Would you like to stay in there while we start it? I would dearly love to see you flip it into and out of transition and see what it is when it makes that switch move. You wouldn't want to be in there when that happens. Probably not, but no. I've been in worse. I yeah. <laughs> oh, here, we'll get out of there. There's a reason for this. Yeah? It can't be that bad. Yeah, it's right. not that high a voltage. I mean, it, is, it is technically what counts as high voltage, but you got to understand, we play with million volt lightning machines all the time, so <laughs> 600 volts, not really high voltage in our world. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the amperage is that... Oh, yeah, the amperage it. is just labeled as wow. Yeah. Just wow. <laughs> now, in here, we've got the main on-off switch, which is pretty cool, and a massive set of contactors. Now there's some upgrades. I, I see solid state happening here. 
So that's, that's probably not as old as the locomotive, though it is pretty old. It's probably like 70 vintage. Um, some contactors, stuff like that, lots of fuses. I'm guessing this is where most of electrical maintenance happens, like for swapping out fuses and stuff. Right. Um, and, and a terrifying, gigantic old Bakelite yeah. knife switch. You want to be careful when you put that in engaged. And you'll notice here some uh, heat absorption material because these do have a habit of sparking. Yeah, you can see the, the gap arresters here. Yeah. Okay, now we'll close this up. I got that side. I got that side. Now, what is that? That is... Do we have any idea? Well, it's something that lubricates, but I'm not sure what it goes down to lubricate. Okay. To. The oil goes in there, and then it drops down. So it's one of those, we don't really know what it is, but right. just put oil in that when it needs it. Right. Don't worry about it. Okay. It's necessary. <laughs> Now, these are, this is the air column here. Um, let me see if I can get this right, okay? All right. All right, now let's see if I can remember this. I, I'll probably get something wrong, but I'm gonna do my best. All right, on the air column, you have, this is pretty much everything that makes it stop, and this is everything that makes it go. First off, you need the key. Now, the key for a locomotive is this great big thing, which is called a reverser handle, and it's a, just a big, solid chunk of metal. Now this goes into the slot right there. Now if you push it forward, the locomotive can go forward. If you push it back, the locomotive can go back. And if you want to park, you put it in neutral and put this in your pocket. But that's the first thing you need. This controls direction, front and back. Now, here is the throttle handle. And there's, is it seven or eight? Uh, I believe there are eight notches eight in Eight notches, okay. So you push the button on the end, pull that back, and you're in basically, think of it as first gear, second gear like that. And this starts you moving. So you pick forward, boom, now you can start moving. Over here, up on top, you've got, that's, this is train line, this is independent? Okay. Very good. So this is now the main know. air brake. This brake stops the entire train. The, the air line out the, by the couplers, that connects to this. Down from here, You've got the bell up front, right? Right. Okay. So this does the bell. Now the bell, like pretty much all the mechanical systems on a train, is pneumatically powered. This, which I'm not going to flip, is sand, and this has three positions. To the back, this would apply sand. On down for traction on a locomotive, you've got sand, and you can dump sand directly in front of or behind of the wheel depending on which direction you want to go there's a little tube that goes down right next to the wheel so if you want to go this way you only want to damp sand on this side of the wheels so you flip the switch that way if you want to go forward you dump sand on the front of the wheels and you go that way now the other lever is this which is the independent brake since we don't have a train attached to us right now this is the brake we'd be using and this is the local, the, the engine brake. I'm sure there's a proper name for it, but I don't know. Independent Just is. Independent? Right. Okay. So that's train line, bell, sand, both front and back, and then independent brake. And I think that's all the, connect the, the controls on there. Now these, the levers push down on both. Now that's to bleed it off a little bit. Yeah, mainly on the independent is what you would push that down to bleed off the air, which when you apply the train brake, that also builds up pressure in your independent. Okay. So what you want to do is bleed off that pressure because you don't want the engine brakes applying. You only want to stop the train with the train brakes. Okay. Now the other switch up here is the, the transition. Okay, so I, I can see a transition switch. And in is series, out is auto. Which we don't use out here. We don't, we don't even use out? Okay. No. Well, um, it stays out. It stays out? Right. Okay. Um, which I'm guessing if in is series and out is auto, out is parallel. That's, that's my guess. So you keep the, engine, the traction motors connected in uh, electrical parallel connection. And this is the one that everybody wants to know, but I'm going to be nice because we're in a residential neighborhood. But that's, that's the horn. And that, that's the horn. And that's all we're going to do because people get upset. Um, this is the dead man control up here. So the, the, the famous railroad stories of guys falling asleep and whatnot, that's, you have to tap this every now and then or the train will stop, basically. Um, up here is kind of a neat thing. It's just a windshield wiper, but it's a pneumatic windshield wiper. And then we've got gauges up front. Um, you want to take us through the gauges and talk about what does what? 
All right, what we've got, we're going to start here. Your white needle on here is your engine reservoir uh, pressure. This is air pressure? Right, this okay. is all air pressure. Um, red is your main pressure on to the, uh, your train line. And over here, your red is your cylinder uh, the pressure on, in each of your cars, you've got the c brake cylinders. Okay. You know, that's telling you what your pressure is in the cylinders. And then again, you've got your brake pipe pressure here. Okay. This is very important, especially in the winter time. That's the speed of the fan to our heater down here. <laughs> <laughs> this is the heater? That, that's, yeah. You know, yeah. That valve right there, when it's open, allows the hot water to come in through our heating system and then we turn that on. And, and this is hot water, like engine water right. from, from up front, to, right. like same as a radiator. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. So we've got engine water temperature here, yep. lube oil pressure here, yep. um, fuel pressure fuel. here. Yep. Now this is air pressure. Is that any particular air pressure? Or? Uh, that one, I'm not even sure it works. But Oh, okay. And then we've got DC amps up right. here and series motor connection, continuous rating, 700 amps. Now that, so. uh, we will watch that if we go into transition. Uh, that will give us an idea when we're going to go into transition. Okay, and I, I see that this is an amp meter that goes all the way up to 1,500 amps. Mm -hmm. That's massive. All right, now check this out. This is one of those really cool moments in my job. They're actually gonna let me start the largest engine I've ever started in my life. So I'm gonna push this button and we're gonna kick over 1,200 horsepower of diesel engine. I feel like a manly man. That's pretty cool. I can deal with that. All right, now, because of the federal regulations, I can't actually drive it, but at this point, all we'd have to do is wait for air pressure to build up, because we don't have any air pressure. So we're gonna let our air pressure build up, and while that happens, we're gonna put some cameras in some cool places, and you guys will get to see this thing move.
so that's a basic look at everything there is to know about an SW9 diesel electric locomotive. Pretty much does it. Cool. I want to thank Bruce and the thank Coopersville you. and Marne Railway and, and Jeff and all the cool guys out here for letting us come out and climb around a big toy and play with 100 tons of sheer awesome. So Always yeah. glad to have you come out and work with oh, it's so hard, so hard. I, I hate this job. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. You, right. <laughs> you guys have fun. I'm Chris Bowden with the Geek Group. This is Bruce with the Coopersville Marne Railway, and we'll see you again next time.
video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.